sing an endless hallelujah. Thank you, Josh and Mary and Clifton and Joanna. Thank you so much for leading us today. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 7. A couple of weeks ago, back on, back on the 9th, because we looked at a Father's Day message on the 16th, and then last week I wanted just in the middle of our 40-day study to challenge our thinking about joy. Joy is not a private matter. To, so when we go back to the ninth, we looked at this. Paul was telling Timothy, you can be a disciple maker. That's what we're called to be. It's, it's, it's not rocket science and it's not a mystery. It's not something that's elusive. It's not something that only a few reach. It's really what God has called all us to be. And he moves from that to start using some, some pictures, some analogies. So today I want us to look in verses 3 to 7 for a few minutes. I want to challenge you. Be encouraged as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. If you found 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 7, I much prefer that you look at them in your Bible. But if you don't have a Bible, we've got the text on the screen for you. Just stand together, why don't we? <clears throat> Paul says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must first must be the first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. We've just read together what? The inerrant infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord press it to us today. If we have come to Jesus Christ, if we've trusted Him as Lord and Savior, we have been enlisted in an army, an army of the Lord. We are to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Be seated. Josiah Askell, would you bring me my water, please? It's, it's sitting right there on, the, on that front pew. I, I left it. Thank you. He's eight years old today. Isn't that wonderful? That's great. You don't have to read very far in the scriptures to realize that Old Testament and New Testament, the scriptures are replete with military references, military images, military motifs. Who, for example, does not know, when I say Joshua, what do you think? You think Joshua? Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho, right? He was a, he was a military commander. He led the children of Israel across into the Promised Land. Moses took them out of Egypt. Joshua led them into Canaan. David, I say David, King David, what do you think? Military commander. David and his mighty men. In the New Testament, however, you see a lot of references to the soldiers that were around, just talking about Roman soldiers in and out of the lives of Jesus and his apostles. But twice in the New Testament, Paul refers to fellow gospel laborers as fellow soldiers. It occurs in Philippians 2.25. He said, he said, I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. Paul uses the imagery of fellow laborers as fellow soldiers. He writes to Philemon. And in verses 1 and 2, he introduces the letter. Timothy's with him. He writes to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier. So in Paul's mindset, to, to labor in the gospel was to be, a, to be a soldier of the Lord, soldier of Jesus Christ. Of course, he uses this language with Timothy in our text. You must endure hardship to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. James and Peter speak of wars that believers engage in especially those within our own remaining sin and fleshly desires. Look at James chapter 4, verse 1. He asked the question, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? In other words, most of the battles we fight as followers of Jesus Christ, in fact, most of the battles you fight in life, whether you're a follower of Christ or not, come from within. They're self-initiated, self-inflicted. We'd like to think that if things around us, if our circumstances would just be better, then our lives would be better. That's just the devil's lie. 
Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. These fleshly lusts, these, these desires that, are, that war against our souls, well-being. And so you have this imagery. We just read from Ephesians 6, and I won't take time to go back through that, but Ephesians 6, 10 to 20, you have the, the armor of the Lord, these various pieces of armor you're to put on so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, that you may be able to quench the fiery darts of the devil. And so you see James and Peter tell us we battle the flesh. Paul tells the Ephesians we battle the devil. He writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 6, about what he calls the weapons of our warfare. This is very instructive here. Verse 3 says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. There are weapons of warfare that are carnal. They're used all around us every day. Some on a, some on a grand military scale, some on a personal scale. Some use their tongues to destroy people. Weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. They're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So we have these weapons, and I've preached a, some sermons on this in past years. I won't go back over that again, but our weapons tear down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to obedience to Christ. So when you, when you get to that point, you're thinking, well, he's talking about us taking on the, the arguments of the day. Well, certainly that's involved in it, but that's not primarily what he's talking about. Because I can't take your thoughts captive. <laughs> I'm to take my thoughts captive. So again, we have this, this battle within ourselves of remaining sin. And so if if you've been looking around, if you're paying attention to what's happening in the news, then you know that this past week, the U.S. Supreme Court effectively struck down, well, they think they did. They decided that marriage has no definition. That marriage is really whatever two people in love want to make of it. Now, we are committed to the scriptures, and so as long as I live, as long as I breathe, marriage will be one man, one woman, joined in a one flesh relationship for all of life. Okay? As long as I breathe. I'll never change my definition. Uh, right now they're saying to us, we simply want you to accept people who don't agree with that. But you know as well as I know that the camel gets his nose under the tent and the next thing that happens is we want you to affirm it. So I'm just here to tell you today, I will never affirm it. I'll never affirm it. I love those who differ on the discussion. I'll try to show love to them, mercy to them, kindness to them, share the gospel with them. I will never affirm any other definition of marriage than one man, one woman, joined in a one flesh relationship for all of life. Why? Am I, am I hard-headed? Am I dogmatic? No, because God gave us that definition. God gave us that definition. Nobody can change it. Nobody can change it. So what do we do? What do we do? What should we do in the light of the recent Supreme Court decisions? What should we do in the light of the recent things that are happening among our political leaders? Because the word is out, that now that the Supreme Court has done this, that, that all 50 states will have political battles, will have, will have legal battles in them to make this the law of every state. Here's what we do. What do we do? We follow Christ. We love God. We love others. We serve the world. Our mission hadn't changed. There's nothing that can happen in our culture that changes our mission. Our mission has not changed. We're to go forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ as his followers. And so I want us just to see from this text a few things in a few minutes. First, I want you to see this encouragement to be faithful. You're in a war. Second, this encouragement to be focused. You've been enlisted by God. Third, this encouragement to be thoughtful. The Lord will give you understanding. Paul says to Timothy, and he would say to us, this is not a word exclusively to him. 
How do you know that? Well, he said to the Corinthians, as a church, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God. So he expects all followers of Christ to be armed with spiritual weapons. He says to the church at Ephesus, put on, you, all of you, put on the whole armor of God. And so we know that he's speaking to us when he speaks to Timothy. It's not an exclusive word to him. It's not even an exclusive word to ministers. It's a word to Timothy, which is to be communicated as a word to all who follow Christ. And so you have this first encouragement to be faithful. You're in a war. He says, you therefore must endure hardship. That We talked to you last week about verb forms and stuff to kind of show you the movement. This is an imperative verb. It's a verb of command. It's not a suggestion. You must endure hardship as a good soldier. It's inevitable. Anyone looking for an easy Christian life is looking for something that the Scripture knows nothing about. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Now I've told you before that word trouble is the Greek word thalipsis. And, and what it means is, in this world you will be squeezed. But he says, be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. We sometimes make a mistake and say to people, look, God will not put more on you than you can endure. That's not really the right way to say it. God will not put more on you than his grace is able to enable you to endure. Because on our own, we can, we can have some things on us that will, that will bring us to our knees and cause us to collapse physically, emotionally, in every way. But God's grace is always sufficient, more than sufficient. And so we need to embrace it, folks. We're in a war. We're in a culture war. Now, when I say that, then as Christians, we're not to fight in, with carnal means. People may say, and it's interesting, the Supreme Court basically said, J Justice Anthony Kennedy basically said in his report for the majority, opinion for the majority, that, that our position on this as Christians is inhuman. It's inhuman. How do we respond to that? Are we going to name call him? No. That's not our war. That's not how we fight. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for him. We're going to pray for our president. We're going to pray for those in office. If we ever have the opportunity. In fact, I would encourage you. Get their emails. Send them the gospel. Tell them I'm praying for you. And here's what I'm going to pray that Jesus Christ will rule his Lord in your hearts. You see, it's too easy to fall into the trap of a Sean Hannity and a Rush Limbaugh who spend their time railing against. Brothers and sisters, we don't need their weapons. We have weapons mightier than that. We're in a culture war, but we're in a culture war to bring the gospel to bear because because the victory, the victory that overcomes the world is faith in Jesus Christ. Not fine arguments, not all these other things. Well, Pastor Bill, what about writing our congressman? Write your congressman. Be salt and light. What about joining in peaceful protest? It's a right we have accorded to us. But do all of that understanding that, that while that is being salt and light, Without the gospel being front and center, we're just saying we don't like strychnine here. We want arsenic. So the solution to our societal problems is a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. So first of all, you're in a war. If you, we've showed it here before in the past. The, I think it was the Queen Mary, wasn't it? What it was, what it was composed of when it was outfitted as a, as a, uh, a, a pleasure ship and when it was transformed for the war into a, a troop carrier and the stark difference but we're not on a pleasure trip we're in a war my friend R.F. Gates again in his wisdom said you know Bill you can tell where people are in the battle by what bothers them if a fellow's in the trenches on the front lines then he wants to know, do we have enough ammunition? Do we have enough troop reinforcement? Do we have 
adequate air cover? Is the artillery functioning? If you're on the front lines, if you're in the trenches, that's what consumes your thoughts. Are we making advance? Are we pushing the enemy back? Is the enemy coming upon us? He said, when a guy is talking about his uniform not fitting right, when he's talking about complaining about the food, when he's complaining about the, the bed, the conditions in the tent, that's a fellow that's not on the front lines. And you can tell where a person is in the battle by what concerns them. What concerns us? How goes the battle? How goes the gospel? Is it being advanced? Are we advancing in our own responsibilities and together? So mark it down, folks. You're in a war. Secondly, there's encouragement to be focused because you've been enlisted by God. <laughs> God's enlisted us. If you want to, he's drafted us. You've been summoned, called by a divine call to serve the God of gods, to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so Paul says it this way to Timothy, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Now he's, you see, people read that and they say, well, that's talking to preachers. No, Timothy, Timothy had responsibilities. Paul was a tent maker. Paul's saying this to everyone. So he's not saying that, we, that you quit your job to be faithfully engaged. What he's saying is that you, that you don't forget why you are where you are. Because wherever you go tomorrow, you're there primarily to be salt and light, to bring, to bring a winsome gospel witness to that place. And ideally, if you were not there, it would be a darker place without you. Whether that's in the workplace, whether that's in the school, whether that's in the neighborhood, whether that's in the marketplace, whether that's on the playground, wherever it is, in the park, in the public arena, wherever you go, you're there to bring gospel light. And you don't get distracted from that. He gives a purpose here. In order that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. That's it. What are we there for? Why, why are we here still? To please him, God, who enlisted us as soldiers in this glorious war called the advance of the gospel. And so he gives that encouragement to be focused. Don't forget why you're here don't forget what you're going different places to do. It's always to be salt and light. It's always to be a gospel witness. Don't be confrontational. Don't, don't fuss. Don't fume. Don't fight. The rest of the world can do that. I would submit to you, if you take the lessons we're learning in this 40 days to a joy-filled life and say, by God's grace, I'm going to take that attitude, that demeanor, that disposition into wherever God takes me today by His providence, I promise you, there are people you're going to be around who are, going to, who are going to note that and mark that. Because they don't need you to teach them how to complain and gripe and grumble. They do that very well themselves. And they don't need to see a Christian version of that. What they need to see is hope and joy and peace in believing in Christ. And no matter what the White House does, no matter what the State House does, no matter what the Congress does, no matter what the Supreme Court does, no matter what the enemies around the world do nothing. We have an unshakable kingdom that we're standing on by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. They need to see that coming out of us in our disposition. That our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. They need to see that. And then he gives these two analogies. The example of an athlete. He says, if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. There's, there is a way that we are to go. There's a way. It's the narrow way. It's the, it's the way that John Bunyan lays out in Pilgrim's Progress. We are to run according to the Lord's plan for us. We don't get to make it up. And he's told us that we're to be people of peace. The wisdom that is from above is first peaceable. It ought to manifest itself in the congregation. When there's not peace in the congregation, we're not competing by the rules. When we're not the bringers of peace, when we're not people of peace going into different arenas, if we bring more discord and more, more turmoil there, we're not running as athletes competing by the rules. He's given us the way to run. In fact, Paul says to the Ephesians that, that he has marked out. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which the Lord has before ordained that we should walk in them. 
He, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews that, that we're to run the race set before us. It's been marked out for us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Remembering him who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. That's how we're to run. We don't get to make it up. We don't get to run in the old way and then say, well, that's the Christian way. No, the Lord's marked out the way. The athlete has got to compete if he's going to win the crown. The crown is the Stephanos, the, the victor's crown that we will receive at the end when he says, well done, good and faithful servant. We'll take our crowns and we may, may put them on our heads for a moment, I don't know, and then we'll cast our crowns before him, the ultimate victor, the author and finisher of our faith. Secondly, he gives the example of a farmer. The hardworking farmer must first must be first to partake of the crops. There is, a, there is a fruit, there is a value in obeying Jesus Christ. There is a, there's a, a precious blessing that comes to us when we endure hardship as good soldiers. Jesus says, whoever perseveres to the end shall be saved. There is a sense in which, in which only those who persevere to the end are saved. As, as a professor of mine said years ago, a faith that fizzles was false from the first. But, but there are blessings along the way. Let me tell you something. If you shirk back, if you shrink back, if you go the, rest, the way the rest of the world's going, you're going to miss manifold blessings. You may be saved by the skin of your teeth as though by fire, but you're going to miss great blessings. There's blessedness in enduring. Consider him who endured we're told. And we endure by God's grace. We say, I'm not going to stop. This is not going to get me down. This is not going to overcome me. By God's grace, I'm going forward. I'm going to go with joy in my heart, a song in my heart, a praise to my God. Because it was the people of God in the Old Testament moving into battles where they were incredibly outnumbered, but they were going in singing praise to God of hope and, and adoration in him and his power that scared the stew out of the enemies and was the occasion for the victory of the people of God. That analogy applies to us today. If we will go forth singing, shouting, praising God in our hearts, if it doesn't come off our lips, if it's happening in our hearts, singing and making merry to the Lord in our hearts, then victory after victory will come to us and we will touch people, we will impact people because they're not interested in long-faced, sad sack, defeatist Christianity. They've got enough of that in their lives without adding Christianity to it. But a Christianity that knows joy, a Christianity that believes that God is all in all, and he'll get the victory and bring us through as more than conquerors, that's very attractive. It's very compelling to people who are discouraged and down. You're meeting them more and more these days, by the way. There's a blessedness, a fruit, a reward to be received and enduring as a soldier of Christ. Finally, encouragement to be thoughtful. The Lord will give you understanding. He says, consider what I say. And this word consider is a word that has about it, use your mind. Use, engage your mind. Think about the, the significance of these things. Think about the implication of these things. What if we together said, by God's grace, I first, because I'm not going to say, Lord, here am I, send somebody else. If I first... And then we together commit that we will, by God's grace, be a people who endure hardship as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. That yes, we're a family of faith, but we also recognize we constitute a small part of the army just to go forth conquering and to conquer. Blessed to be a blessing, bringing light to the darkness, hope to the hopeless, freedom to the prisoner, sight to the blind. And we go with our gospel, which does that. Be thoughtful, he says. Consider what I say. And if you'll be thoughtful about this, then the Lord gives further understanding. You see, some people say, well, I don't understand. Well, you're not thinking seriously about the first things. You can't go on and act like the rest of the world and think that you're going to be given great understanding in the Word. You're not. You're not. It's impossible. Think on the basic things. Am I, start, am I a joy-filled Christian? Because if I'm not there then the rest is going to be mush and confusion. But if I am becoming a joy-filled Christian, if I'm thinking about the implications, engaging my mind with truth, and letting the truth subdue me, then the Lord will open up our understanding in a lot of other areas in terms of how we live in times like these. John said it this way, in 1 John 5, 4 and 5. 
For whatever has been born of God, that's the flow of the verb there, is overcoming the world. So if a person has been born of God, then you're an overcomer. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. It's faith in action. You see, faith is never a private thing that you just keep to yourself and say, well, I just, I just believe. I just never stop believing. No. If you're going to be an overcomer, the victory that overcomes the world is our faith. It's faith in action, faith expressed in hope and joy and peace and believing. Paul said it this way in Romans. You know this passage well in 8, chapter 8, verses 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of God, from, from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, which is death? You see... What does it sound like in that? Sounds like you need to endure those hardships. Come all the way through. Not run from them. Not shrink from them. Not, not panic and pass out and fear them. Endure through them. Because even facing the sword, as our brothers and sisters in Christ are doing all around the world today, is not the, it does not ruin their lives. It gives them entrance into the kingdom of the Son of God's love. As it is written, he says, Citing the Old Testament, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And the word more than conquerors, I've told you before, is a compound to force of conqueror. It actually has the preposition super on the front of it. We are super conquerors. We're not just conquerors. Folks, we're certainly not survivors. As Christians, we should not be interested in surviving. That's an insult to the grace of God. We are conquerors. No, more than conquerors. Like Tom Rainer said about the Christian life. He said in the Christian life, he said it's like a, it's like a football game. He said the devil and his team are always on defense. We're always on offense. Every time we fumble, the devil's got to give the ball back. He said it's not a question of are we going to win. He said, the question is really, as Christians, how much are we going to run up the score? How much are we going to run up the score? That's the way God has designed the Christian life. The gospel's not in doubt. God's people will gather around the throne worshiping Him and worshiping the Lamb. It's not in doubt. And so we need to remember we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I'm persuaded, he says, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing will do that. Nothing will do that. So let's go. Let's go forward. Let's go forward and sow the good news. Let's go forward and show people the love of Christ. Let's go forward and, and, and when your friends say, well, what do you think about what the Supreme Court did this week? You say... Well, it's really sad that they think they can redefine an institution they didn't design, but it doesn't change where I'm going, and it doesn't change my commitments, and it doesn't change my purpose. In fact, if anything, I believe I have the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if our leaders want to, want to turn out the lights in our culture, then all that does is make my gospel shine more distinctly, more brilliantly, more obviously. Let's go good soldiers of Jesus Christ. We're in a war. But we're in a war because we've been chosen, we've been enlisted by God to join the conflict. We're in a war that if we will engage our minds and commit our lives to declaring and dispensing gospel truth and light, then we will be participating in what we are more than conquerors. Folks, there's not an entity on earth, there's not an entity in hell, and certainly not an entity in heaven that can keep us from being victorious in Jesus Christ. Can't happen. Can't happen. God has promised that victory is ours. You know the only thing that keeps us from participating in victory? is shrinking back from advancing the gospel. The gospel's going to go whether they take it or not. But oh, to get in on that, to come to the end 
with marching design, onward Christian soldiers marching us to war with the cross of Jesus going on before, to be a part of that noble enterprise, not cursing the culture. The culture's cursed. Let the culture curse. We come to bless. We come to bless. And if we're blessed to be a blessing and we purpose to bless others in Jesus' name, you'll be surprised how the power of the gospel falls on people that right now are sworn enemies to the cross of Christ. It's God's way. It's God's way. Let's pray together.